Hello and welcome to this British Library Food Season event sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell, I'm the Food Season's founder and curator and I work very closely with Angela Clutton who is the season's guest director. This year, as for the previous three food seasons, we have some wonderful events running all the way through April and May, celebrating the politics, the passions, and the pleasures of food. Do find out about other events by looking at the British Library web pages for the food season. Also on those pages, you will find details about a competition that we're running, with you being able to have an opportunity to, to win a KitchenAid cordless appliance, a day on a virtual cookery course, and wonderfully signed copies of Callum Franklin's pie book. Now, before we get to this event, a couple of housekeeping points. On the menu on your screen, you will find a feedback button. Please do let us know what you think about our events. It's really important to us to have your feedback. There's also a donate button. The British Library is a charity and we rely upon support to be able to bring you the world's knowledge and inspiration. There's also a tab for questions. We would love to have questions from you. I know that Callum is looking forward to answering them. And there's also a tab for books. So uh, books from guests across the season, but including Callum's books as well. So Callum Franklin, anyone who's watching who loves pies will know about Callum, but here's a few details about him and his life. He started out working in food as a kitchen porter in Kent and then went on to train at Chapter One, a Michelin star restaurant also in Kent. He subsequently worked in some of the, the top restaurants in the UK, including the Ivy, number one Aldwych and Roast in Borough Market. It was in 2015 that his passion for pies started, and since then he has established himself as the pie maestro of the nation. He has more than 200,000 followers on Instagram, and when he publishes some of his porn pie, his pie porn, it goes viral. Uh, he is an amazing chef, an amazing pie man, and he is here with us today live. Callum, so lovely to be here. Where are we? Can you tell me where we are in this wonderful room? So we are in the heart of Holborn Dining Room. We're in the pie room. Okay? This is the pie kitchen where we produce all the savoury pastry for the restaurant, for retail as well. Uh, it's where a large part of my heart resides. <laughs> <laughs> and how did this room come about? What, what, when, you know, what, what was the sort of idea behind it? Yeah, so... Um, we go back to the beginning yep. right so this building is old this is about i think it's 110 maybe a few more years than that old um and it has in the basement this large store which over years has been used for different things but as chefs we would go to the aladdin's cave right we go down there and we'd find things like silver service trolleys we get them we take them to the silversmiths in london get them refurbished and use them in the restaurant and one day I was down there and I found this pie tin which had kind of interlocking parts, keys for it. And I knew what it was, but mm. I didn't know how to use it. You'd never technique. made a pie using no. a piece of equipment like this. No, exactly that. And I thought, well, I want to learn how to do it, right? So I took it up to the kitchen and showed it to my number two at the time, a guy called David Burke. that opened, He opened some of the biggest restaurants in the UK and super experienced, and he was like scratching his head. So like, I've, I've never used one. And it was, the, my, it was like this moment where I was like, wow, like this is a very traditional technique yeah. that we don't know. Yeah. And that actually it turned out none of the like 35 chefs in my kitchen knew. So that's really interesting. So there's this kind of, you know, pie making as a tradition, like when you look at historical cookery books from the 19th century, well, and, and before, like from medieval times, pies are such a kind of central feature and so important in that kind of, in that kind of tradition of professional chefs. And then what you're saying is there's this sort of generation of chefs, you being professionally trained, classically trained, mm. have not had experience of making pies. Is that, yeah. that's right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that, it's definitely at that technical level, none of us knew, right? That is extraordinary. So um, what was it, what was the first pie that you then made or tried to make? Can you remember? Yeah, I think the first one that we really wanted to understand and sort of conquer was a, was a corset pie, which is actually the one that we're going to do today. Okay, Right, great. it's incredibly traditional, 
uh, you, see, you see it in history books going way back. And yeah, I kind of looked at it and I was like, oh my goodness, how do, <laughs> how do you do this? But then it's, that was kind of one of the beauties of the Pyram as well was that because none of us had that training and that knowledge, actually we had to find our own techniques quite often. Sometimes it makes things quite drawn out, but sometimes it meant that we found maybe faster ways of doing things because no one told us that there was this sort of official way. way. Right, yeah. So how do you go from 2015 finding that pie mould and sort of starting on this journey of learning these techniques to ending up with this sort of bespoke room for pies in the centre of London? What, what, what happened? So we, as we sort of did more and more and more in the kitchen, we, we were doing it in the main kitchen, which is hot and busy, right? And uh, we got to a point where I felt that I'd kind of maxed the capability of doing it in that room. So I said to the team, we either stop here and just keep it like that, or if we really want to push it forward, we need to build a space. And we had this space on the side of the restaurant. Um, and I approached, you know, the owners of the building and said, look, I want to build a pyro, right? And kind of <laughs> pitched it to them slightly better than that. But I, you know, I had sort of empty room, sat there, drew one wall, drew the other wall, drew that wall, put the drawings down, took it to them and said, look, you know, I want to link this room to history and tradition and surround chefs in detail and make it the ultimate room for pie making. And, and this... As the ultimate room for pie mating, had this amazing piece of marble mm. here, which is obviously was kept at a cool temperature. There's all these kind of, I guess, old traditional sort of pieces of equipment around. And yet there's also state-of-the-art equipment as well. So this yeah. relationship between the traditional, the craft, but also kind of innovation and modern. Is that what you're trying to do in this room and with your pies? Yeah, absolutely. So. With pie making, we always reference back to history and look back at, you know, traditional technique and then see how we can apply that using the knowledge that we have today, not just with equipment. And, you know, like when you say about technology, we have, you know, induction hobs built into worktops that you don't see, right? Because we, we want to keep it looking traditional. But, you know, in, in farming, Right. So when we talk to our, you know, our farmers about how we want our beef and things like that. So we use all of those modern techniques married with the traditional technique to try and make pies at their best. Right? And, and so to what extent are you using and drawing from historical sources? I mean, I know we had we had that fabulous day a few years back when you came to the British Library and we looked yep. at historical recipe books from the 1300s through to the 1920s. The dream day. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember? I mean, what struck you? I guess about those historical sources, or how do you use historical sources in your work? So, I mean, for example, one thing that we would look at with a pie, which we can see in historical references, would be not only you know how a, a whole animal would be used and put into a pie in different techniques and styles, but you know, how things, you know, how a, a certain protein of meat was treated in different techniques as well. So, for example, pie we're going to do today, uh, that references, you know, a goose pie recipe uh, from, you know, London's most famous pie maker, who I think you know. Edward Kidder. Edward Kidder, right? <laughs> so, uh, in his cold goose pie recipe, uh, you know, he talks about how some of the meat is, is roasted over open fire before it goes in there. So, we're going to look at that with the pie that I've done today using slightly different techniques. Um, but it means that there's different flavours and textures in there. And people were doing that way back then. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that struck us, wasn't it? How when we were looking at some of these historical cookery books, lots of the techniques and lots of the equipment were exactly the same as what you're using yeah. now. Um, perhaps it's worth just saying something about Edward Kidder. Because he, he was your neighbour in a sense, wasn't he? Yeah. His, so his, his cookery book was published in 1720, I think, and he had a pie shop and a cookery school just down the road here. Yeah. And according to his obituary, I think it was in 1760, he had um, taught 6,000 ladies how to make pies. And I see 
you, you I think feel, it's exaggerated. You feel like you're jealous of that, aren't you? A little you, bit. You, <laughs> I think you're <laughs> fond of wife. Edward Kidder, <laughs> but you you are jealous of that, that legacy. Yeah. Uh, so 6,000 ladies knew how to make pies because mm. of Kidder, and he was an ama- apparently this incredible sort of pastry chef. So the pie you're making is a goose pie. Yeah. And the recipe for he gives is quite simple, isn't it? As in, it doesn't have a lot of detail. Mm. But you weren't put off by that, were you, when, when we looked at the recipe? No, because I think, you know, we, we, we can be quite long-winded with recipes nowadays. He leaves a little bit more to the imagination, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But what it means is that we can do an interpretation of what yeah, he yeah. would have done, yeah. right? So... Should we do one? Should we do one? I'm very much hoping that um, the audience are able to see uh, mm. the pictures of Kidder's book and indeed of Kidder with his uh, twinkly, sparkly eyes looking rather roguish and pleased that he's annoying you some 300, <laughs> 300 years later. Let's let's have a go at making this pie right. then. So, what are we going to... Okay. So we've got a pie mix here okay. first. Is that uh, the... This is the goose, is it? Mm-hmm. And okay. then... And this uh, is this the effectively the pie mold that you came across this a version yeah, of this. Yeah, it was a version of this. So yeah. this is a modern version of that. Yeah. So it's a non-stick one. Um, from actually this is made in France. This one. Um, we need to get a British company to start making these. Yeah, I happen to know for rather odd reasons mm. that these are fantastically expensive. They cost one hundred and twenty-nine pounds. I recently looked it up. Yeah. If someone is starting out making pies, mm-hmm. they don't need to have this, no, do they? This is when you become an obsessive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but um, yeah, we do need to get someone to start making them, yeah. mass manufacturing them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perhaps so, that could be your next project. Yeah, maybe I'll, I think you're onto something. <laughs> we should do it together. So this is a corset pie mold, right? Which okay. gives you that incredible shape, yeah. that sort of rib side. Yeah. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna line this with a pastry that I made from the goose fat. It's from the actual bird. Okay, and what what sort of quality to the pastry will that fat give it? So, yeah, I mean, one of my favorite types of short crust pastry, which I make, is a split of lard and butter, Okay. right? Which gives uh, a bit of a crispness to the pastry with the lard. Um, also a better flavor, I feel as well, you know, if it's not just all butter. So I thought, you know, you have so much fat on a goose. I was like, how am I gonna use all this up? So I'll render it down, you know, what would Kidder do? I'll render it down <laughs> and, then I'll fi- and, I'll, and then I'll work on a pastry recipe. So I developed a pastry recipe for this pie. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it gives it a different flavor. It gives it a shine to the pastry. Uh, it makes it slightly temperamental. Right, well, it's, okay, it's, well, because it's more um, subject to melting more quickly. The yeah, fat is very... Exactly yeah. that. So, you know... Uh, Do you like, have to work it quite quickly? Yeah, a beef lard, something like that, is, is much firmer. Okay. Um, but the goose, yeah, goose can be quite soft, a bit like duck fat. Okay. And, uh, Oh, I'm just and and so in. again, for people watching who perhaps aren't going to render down their own goose fat, um, bought pastry. Talk us through. Do you know what? What, I, what do you think? A bought short crust, I, a bought puff pastry. I am not hundred percent against shop bought pastry for the simple reason that people's lives are so busy nowadays. Yeah. Right? You don't necessarily have a whole day to do pastry making, rest yeah. your pastry dough. So actually in my cookbook, I say that in there. I say, look, here's the pastry recipes, but if you don't have time, buy a really good short, short crust, puff pastry. Um, but for this, we've, we've made we've it. We've gotten so the whole the hot, fantastic. But actually, that makes me think, Callum, I want to just come back to this mm. point about you sort of realising that you had never been trained in, in sort of formal pastry work. Why is it that a sort of generation of chefs stopped learning sort of classical pastry work. Why do, you, why do you think that happened? I think because it can be so time consuming. It's very labor intensive pie making. So for restaurants actually it's quite difficult. And I think that's why you saw over the last sort of century, the move towards the sort of pot pie, you know, like a pastry lid on something. And it was because people didn't have time to line pies properly in restaurants. And, but, as with pie making throughout history, you know, it's peaks and troughs mm-hmm. where you see it's kind of, you know, the pie suddenly becomes fashionable again. And, mm. you know, I was reading about 
uh, there was a period in the sort of uh, 18th century where chefs were genuinely sort of having these these battles with each other about who could make the most elaborate pie for banquets, right? It was like they'd open a pie lid a, on a table, a huge pie, and there'd be a band inside it playing music, <laughs> right? Obviously, they weren't in there. I'm feeling disappointed now. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't in there when it was cooked, but... You know, yeah, and, uh, but this kind of absolute, the pious spectacle yeah. being this kind of, yeah, I can and see I that. And I feel that right now, across the, across the country and also around the world, you see it a lot now, that's happening. Mm. And it's kind of thanks to social media a little bit because... They're so visual. Yeah, and chefs yeah. are seeing each other's work and you see this, who can do the most elaborate thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's sparked off, you know, pie making again around, around this country. And it makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me really happy. So with this, what we're going to do? So I've just rolled out this pastry. Um, Can I feel it? Yeah. So this is. I mean, oh, it's yeah. very cold at the moment. Yeah. But it's about sort of half a centimeter thick. Um, very yellow because I use really nice eggs. I use really good butter when I make pastry dough because. Yeah. You know, because it's, you can. It's, yeah. Why not? <laughs> right. You might as well use the best that you can. So for this technique, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out a base, a top, and then a strip down the middle okay. that's going to line it. So mm -hmm. for the base, we're just going to use the actual mould itself, like so. When we're not in COVID times mm -hmm. and when the restaurant out there, because beyond this room here is a, is a large dining room, how many, how many covers so does have, that do? Indoors, we have 200 and... 20, I yeah. think, inside. It, it's a sizable dining room. Yeah. So there's 200 seats out there. When you're in full swing, how much pastry are you making and or how many pies are you are you making in a given day, yeah, a busy I mean, day? It, well, it's hundreds in here, right? Yeah. So we have a team generally of about sort of um, four or five chefs in here working all day um, from quite early on in the day. To, to make sure we've got enough pies. Um, and also on top of that, you know, we sell pies through the windows as well for retail. So it's quite a lot going a busy, on in, in, a... in the pie room. Yeah. And are those chefs, are they, you know, do they work in other parts of the kitchen or do they tend to specialise in, in the pies? So what we do here, because there's quite a demand to work in here now. So in, have, in the, in in the pie room. room. Yeah, so we have a lot of chefs from sort of over, or over and around the world who want to come here and learn traditional British technique, right? So lo loads of chefs from America want to come here. I think it's, it's that sort of idea of seeing a really, really British kitchen. Mm. So what we realized was, was that people only wanted to come and work in here. So we decided that you have to work in the main kitchen here first. You have to earn your position in here. Right, okay. So actually all of my chefs come through here, spend, you know, uh, they'll spend three months in here learning technique before the next person gets to come in and have a go. And um, yeah, it's lovely. I mean, it's run by, as actually we have Knox who runs this yeah. kitchen. She's one of my sous chefs. And uh, she, you know, oversees this day to day, you know, cracks the whip in here. <laughs> She's very, very good and extremely talented pie maker. And um, yeah, it's a good place to kind of come and learn some interesting knowledge. Fantastic. Why don't so you tell I'm me gonna, what you're doing? I've got so some questions. Just, so that, base is you know slightly smaller than the top okay. because the top's going to have to meet uh, the crimping so I'm just going to pop that straight in there and I hope you can see that yeah, yeah, on yeah. your screen that's good. so it just goes in and that overlaps the corners slightly in the sides yeah so that's going to allow me to join this to it afterwards right okay. so I'm just going to fold that's that straight in there and then kind of open it up this is definitely one of those things where you've just made that look fantastically easy and... But it, yeah, well, mm. no, I don't know, there's, there's... But there's a kind of confidence, I suppose, you have to have to just go at it, yeah. is that right? I mean, there's a nervousness around pie making because I think people have disasters sometimes with pastry at home because it's got too hot or, you know, it's, it's cracked when they're cooking it. But, you know, it, I say this all the time, like, no, if you can if you can drive a car on a road, you can sort of manoeuvre a, a one-ton vehicle with other ones driving around you. You can do pie making, right? <laughs> it's it's flour and water. Um, so all I've done there is sort of 
popped it in there, overlapped it, and then I'm just going to start kind of squashing that down. So that, so it, that it gets those indentations. Exactly that, right? Before I kind of um, okay. push the sides against. So you, you just said a moment ago that people want to come here to learn mm. traditional British pie making techniques. Yeah. Can you sort of have a go at defining what that means, like as compared to French pie making techniques? What, yeah. What's the sort of distinction that you're making? So for me, it would, you know, the, the easiest thing to sort of define that by would be sort of traditional pie doughs, right, that we have in this country that you don't see really anywhere else. So things like a suet pastry, yeah. uh, hot water pastry, and kind of... A hot water pastry would be like for a pork pie, right? Yeah. A cold pie, a cold, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, what we do here with a hot water pastry um, maybe is slightly different to other people's techniques, but, you know, we look to, um, you know, why, why is it with a hot water pastry you have to work with it while it's, when it's warm, mm. right? Because it goes brittle. So, you know, we added egg to ours to sort of slightly adjust that and, uh, and work that out over a long period of time. So we could actually work with it cold and sort of get much more detail on pies. So things like that, this sort of weird knowledge that we've all learned here over trial and error, that's what people want to come and learn. And, uh, and I guess over time, you know, if that's passed on, that becomes part of British the, pie making. The tradition. Right? Yeah. Um, is there a sort of is there a sort of golden period that you would like to be able to travel back in time to to yeah. experience? When, when would that have been? Like I think the 18th century was when it was kicking off. Like <laughs> when people were doing wild stuff. <laughs> right, that's when you look in the books and you see like incredibly elaborate stuff. And but in the Kidder book, there's that amazing uh, boar's head. He makes a mm. he doesn't makes a complete boar's head out of pastry, doesn't he? Which is stuffed with boar's head. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, with tusks and everything and yeah but what i find so interesting about that stuff is that you know still at that point a lot of that pastry was inedible right so to get that super elaborate design and height on things salt pastry was quite often used yeah. because that gives you structure and it holds in an oven as well so what i want to do with pie making is to replicate that but in terms of the sort of just the visual display and the kind of beauty yeah. of them. But, but, but to make to eat, it all edible. Eat the pastry. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that's how, Yeah. that's then when we apply technique and knowledge and, and technology to yeah. do those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think this is this really interesting thing about pies. Like they are about spectacle. They are, even a kind of simple pie is incredibly pleasing visually, isn't it? It just, yeah. they, they do look beautiful, but they can also look incredibly dramatic. But I suppose the, the, what you've done with your pies is also make sure that they deliver in terms of originality, flavor. They're never just straightforward and they're never, you know, they're never boring. Yeah. They're never going to disappear point on the flavor or the look. And I suppose that's what you're always working with, isn't it? The yeah, two things. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that keeps me, always keeps me happy about pie making is that it, it's not one technique. Right? It's all of these things rolled together. So it's butchery, it's pastry work, it's charcuterie work, yeah, yeah. it's all of these things. So like in here, yeah, I was gonna we've ask. got, you know, uh, a, a sort of an emulsified minced mix. Is right? that what they or would be called force meat in yeah, the recipe? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, with the fat that we've got in there, we've added water and using, you know, very traditional, almost like sausage making technique, emulsified water into that so it's juicy. And then where Kidder was roasting goose and then using the shredded meat, mm -hmm. what I did instead was I brined some of the breast and then smoked it over oak. And then, so we've got, you know... So that for the flavour and the texture yeah, to get to re fantastic. replicate that open fire flavour that mm -hmm. he would have. And then I've left some of the breast raw. Um, I've put mace in here, mm -hmm. which was, you know, it was used a lot in pie making. And if you look at the recipes that do have measurements back then, it was like heavy amounts of mace. Like, yeah, much heavier than we would use, doesn't yeah, it? Really mace quite and all spiced. Spice. Yeah, yeah, all spice. And what else is in there? Is that is so, it parsley or thyme? Or yeah, what? I put lots of fresh parsley and I put some rosemary mm. in there as well because, um, again, I think you know a lot of a lot of herbs would have been used as well as spices back then, quite often to mask the flavour of the meat, which 
wasn't always refrigerated, mm -hmm. right? So that's why a lot of heavy spicing was used. I use it more to add another level of flavor, yeah. right? Another depth of flavor. Um, there's a bit of mustard seed in there, which I love in pie making. Oh, okay. Because what it does is that mustard seed, aside from the flavor that it gives you, if you put it in dry, it'll absorb some of the moisture in cooking and sort of swell up. And then when you're eating it, they just pop in your mouth with the mm. sort of roasted pie juices. Uh, roasted pie juices is something I wish I could just produce on a mass scale. <laughs> I think I'd be a billionaire. But, um, well, that with the pie tin that yeah. we'll be launching soon. Well, you're really pressing that down? Yeah, because what's because that Because what happens if you don't do that? It, well, I want, I want that pastry to really press against the side of the tin. So when we cook it, it gets the definition on the sides, okay. right? So we're really packing that in there. Um, yeah. Okay. And also that will give us a lovely cut through at the end, right? Because it'll yeah. just be a nice slice of meat. So all I'm going to do now is just trim up that. So I've got about an inch mm -hmm. of collar going around. It's a lot of meat in there, isn't it? Isn't it? it I mean, is. for a sort of quite small package, yeah. it's actually, what so would that, that feed? It's about one and a quarter kilo, I think, something okay. like that. Um, so now all we're going to do is seal that lid on. Okay. So. And your wash, because I've, I've read your book, what do you yeah. use for your wash? Because it's not just so it's, egg, is it? It's just pure egg oh, yolk. Oh, is it? Just egg yolk. Just egg yolk, right? So yeah. that's the, the key for me is that if you use egg white, especially when you're like, you know, washing on the top of something, that's the last, you know, it's the last thing that goes on, it's the finish. And egg white will always leave a streak, right? Mm. So the only thing that would, it, that it would be, beneficial for is the shine that it gives. Okay. So you can recreate that by adding a touch of dairy. So you could add a touch of cream, a touch of milk mm -hmm. to it. It's what the French do with, you know, viennoiserie. They put a little bit of cream that, in there. Uh, yeah. The only thing you have to be careful with that is if it's something that's huge and is gonna cook for a long time, it might be too dark. Okay. So I'd have, I wouldn't do it if I'm cooking something that's gonna take an hour in the oven. It's a smaller pie that's going to take about 15 minutes or something. I'd it's add fine. a touch of cream. So we're just sealing that lid on there now. And it's actually, you know, this is pretty, this is actually quite a workable dough. You know, it's been sat out here. It's still not too soft. Yeah. Um, and then all we're going to do is crimp this onto the lid. So I'll give it, it's, this is when it's going to get its first egg wash. So okay. a light brushing of that whole egg over the surface so and then flick it over the edges so so for people thinking getting inspired now and thinking mm -hmm. okay i'm going to give all of this a go what what equipment do they have to have what what do you need to have to be able to make pies uh for me a nice rolling pin yeah right buy yourself a nice big heavy rolling pin because what that does is that's one thing people find difficult always is is rolling out pastry evenly so if you're using a tiny little, little rolling pin, yeah. that's um, half of the problem, yeah. right? Get a heavy one, and that heavy rolling pin will do most of the work for you, right? So you get a nice even roll. The other thing is to always work on a flat surface. So you can buy yourself a nice big wooden chopping board mm -hmm. if you don't have a flat surface at home. And then really... That's it. So now, yeah, pastry brush, you know? It's pretty easy. Yeah. Like, uh, you don't need too much to sort of set up for pie making. Okay, this is the bit. So this is crimping. Where you're going to make it. Um, I'm going to let the audience into a secret here, and that's the Polly is actually really good at crimping. <laughs> that is patently not true. It is. I remember we did it together before once. We did it and I was once. Like, and it oh was... wow, you're really good at this. <laughs> um, so this is like um, my favourite technique for crimping. So it's sort of two hands. You just use your index finger and... on your opposite hand for a guide. And you just sort of roll it over almost like a wave. Yeah. Um, one thing that's really important when you do this style of pie is that the crimp doesn't overhang too much because... Overhang on the other... Over the other edge. Because... Yeah. Because when you cook it, that yeah. side will start drooping. Oh, so right? okay. you might get a So it needs here. the support on the yeah. ends. And so the thing that always makes me nervous about making a pie like this is 
is ensuring that the pastry on the inside or mm -hmm. you know the bottom is not, is not going to be raw and that's going to be due to the heat of the oven so really hot or and then how do you stop it burning What's yeah, the this is a really interesting right because over time we always used to go super hot oven quick cook as fast as possible yeah. when we first started and actually i was working with a chef in hong kong He's an old friend of mine. A couple of years ago, I went out there to do some uh, pastry work with him at his restaurant just to help him out. And um, he said to me, oh, when I worked in California, we did a certain type of pastry and we used to cook it at a lower temperature for much longer. And I started to sort of play around with that. So now my technique is a mix of both. So we start off pies at a very high temperature, right. around sort of 200 degrees. What that does is that will set the pastry, yeah. right? So any shape or design you wanted, you don't lose the definition of it. Yeah. It instantly sort of, you know, keeps that. And then we drop the temperature down to generally about sort of 180, 175, depending on what it is, and then cook it slowly. Okay. Yeah. And, and the pastry will always be cooked if you do that. And so a pie like this would take how long? About between 45 minutes and 55 minutes. Really, is that all? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, they cook quite quickly. I'm I think because this one is slightly, is that concave? Concave, con concave? yeah, concave. So that, it, yes. Um, and presumably you, that's why they're concave, in order yeah, that it, it allows been. the heat distribution. Um, but bigger pies sometimes that we make can take anywhere up to sort of two hours. If, it's, yeah. if we're making a wedding pie, we do those kind of huge tiered pies sometimes for people. They can, yeah, they, you have to be very sort of careful about those ones. Because you don't want the pastry overcooked either, right? No. For me, I love like a mahogany sort of colour to pastry. Yeah, quite dark, not, yeah. but not burnt, obviously. Yeah. There's flavour when it's got a bit of caramelisation. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing worse than flaccid pastry, is there? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Nobody likes that. <laughs> Right, so I mean that's kind of Beautiful. you know the technique for it. So what I would do to finish that would be give that a little time to dry in the fridge, mm -hmm. give it a second coat, and do you know egg wash these as well, and then I would cut a chimney into that. Yes, chimney is super important. Yep. Right, because it's roasted fat inside, so it needs to escape. It's got to escape somewhere. If you don't put a chimney, it'll either burst out from the side or down here. Okay. You'll lose it. Yeah. And that's liquid gold. So we put a chimney in and the chimney will allow some steam to escape, but also give somewhere for that fat to go. And then when it cools down, it will go it will back go in, back and, in. And moisten it and, and it's flavor, loads of flavor. Right, so I put that one away and then we've got one. You've, you've made, made one earlier, earlier which yeah. is fantastic. So for people who are wanting to start out making a pie, is there a Pie that perhaps we'll look at your cookery book later, yeah. and you can advise uh, what people should should start with. Yeah, for sure. After this, I'll show yeah. you one in the cookbook that um, okay. we can definitely eat. Okay. Right. So, ah, oh. this is it cooked, right? So. Remember I was saying Beautiful. about... I so want, can I just say, this is yeah. a pie to eat cold? Yes. For yeah, sure. Yeah. It's yeah. a cold eating pie. Yes, yeah, so this is a cold goose pie. Actually, I mean, you could eat it hot, right? The only thing for me is that uh, when we put all of those techniques into something, I really want to see that when I slice it through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, when we're talking about using the whole goose as well, I mean... The, the jelly that we've put in there, that's a roast goose jelly yeah, as well. Yeah, so yeah. we've really used every part of that bird in there. So, God, I hope this has worked. <laughs> so, so do I. I'm going to cut it. <laughs> so, <gasps> there it is. Right? Isn't that? Oh, that looks beautiful. Colour. So, I'll put that like that so you can see that you've got just enough space for the jelly. Um, and then you've got those different cuts yeah. in there. So you've got smoked breast, you've got, you know, just just salted breast, mm. the thigh meat from the bird. Um, you know, I, yeah, it that looks right. amazing. It does try? smell, yes, I'd love to. Right, and what, what is the difference between that pastry and a, uh, the sort of pastry you get on a pork pie? What would the t textural difference be? Um, so, uh, yeah, probably it'd be slightly more crisp on a pork pie. Yeah. Um, 
But that's the other thing with me, right? Is for traditional pork pies, I, I love them, but I prefer to have slightly less pastry on yeah. a pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ratio of it. Um, but it's a contentious point because some people are like, no, I want like 50-50 pastry and to a pie. To a pie, but um, I like to have oh. a sort of nice mix of, of the jelly, the pastry. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. But this and this really feels like it's part of that tradition of of the sort of um, I guess the sort of side table of pies in a I guess a Victorian sort of house when people they have a pie pies are there and available for guests over the christmas period yeah you know it's a sort of pie that lasts quite a while for entertaining yeah and i think that's why so many people buy large pork pies at christmas right it is that thing of the christmas table and it's just there you can sort of go up and tuck into it any point during christmas yeah. day or boxing day yeah yeah it smells completely delicious it feels rather mean doing this to when there's people watching who can't enjoy it. Mm. Mm. You get the smokiness, right? I like that. Mm. I'm pretty happy with that. It's absolutely beautiful. Also that kind of mix of textures. Mm. It's, mm, it's lovely and you do get that smokiness and the lovely pieces of goose. It's beautiful. And in the jelly, <clears throat> Apologies. I um, I just put, I just finished it with a tiny bit of raw cognac. So I made the you know really beautiful stock. Mm. We spent two days making a roasted stock. The la the very last thing that went in there was a tiny sprig of fresh rosemary, mm. and then a couple of drops of raw cognac, and it just cuts through the sort of fatness and the, yeah. that mouthfeel. So, I don't really want you to take it away, but I'll come back to that later. Can you, There's plenty there. Can, can you just quickly explain about the, um, the, what did you call it, the hole at the top? Mm. Did you just make that? Did you just cut yeah. it? Or you didn't put anything? Did you put a funnel in it? I put a funnel. So I, I, Is it like a metal funnel that you well, put in there? Yeah, I mean, we, d we have those. If I wanted to do one that's a slightly bigger size or a smaller size, what I'll do is I'll cut that out with a little pastry cutter, yeah. circular cutter, and then I'll wrap tin foil around that cutter, and then I know that that's going to fit back in that hole, and I'll pop it in there. Um, so, so can someone use tin foil if they don't have a specific? Mm -hmm. That you could just use tin yeah. foil. As, okay, perfect. But that's also something that's like throughout British history is is actually pie funnels. Yeah. All right. Somebody contacted me one day and said, "I've written a book on on pie, pie funnels." Yeah. Love it. I've got it now. Oh, I, I love. love it. I have to see that. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, so. Someone starting out, mm -hmm. making their first pie or you know, first foray into pies, what sort of pie would you suggest that they make? Could, have you got something in your book that you, we yeah. can look at? Because I think... For sure, let me show you. So, yeah. And then perhaps what is the most complicated pie in that book that you yeah, make? Yeah, so in here look. we have uh, one of the sort of more simple ones would be... I think something really traditional, like, and it, it also, I mean, it's great to, if you've never made a traditional British pie, to do something which is steeped in history, right? So I would do a, uh, where is it? Steak and kidney pudding. Right. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to find it now. Uh, it is definitely in this cookbook. Yeah. But yeah. But you go for a suet pudding. Suet pastry, okay. steamed, right? Credible technique. Don't really see it anywhere else either, mm. right? It's really suited to, to British cooking and, and sort of cold winter nights yeah. and, and um, understanding about what the suet is there for in the pastry, um, the anticipation of taking the mould off at the table. Mm. I love it. I absolutely love it. And uh, it's something that we always have on in the, in the restaurant in, on the menu. Yeah. Um, and then slightly more complex. Um, yeah, I mean, this is. I mean, is I one... think you should, when you say slightly more complex, mm. I'd say a, before anyone else thinks, oh, shall I make the suet pudding or this? That's a lot more complex. It's, probably a lot... <laughs> it's a lot more complex. Can you describe what that is? Because so, it's really in, inventive, this. Yeah, I mean, well, that was based on, you know, sort of classic cheese, potato, and onion pie, right? We were like, how do we recreate that in a restaurant experience? So. Um, I just wanted to elevate it slightly, so we thought, you know, dauphinoise potato, like, oh, 
just, I love it. <laughs> could eat it all day long. So we thought, what if we layer that inside a pie with a great cheese, caramelized onion, so it's, you know, it's This is all carb earthy. on carb on mm. carb with some cheese. Yeah. Delicious. But this recipe in the book gives you a mm. sort, this is what I love about pie making, it gives you a sort of canvas to then make it look extremely pretty and beautiful because it's a large surface area. You make the dauphinoise the day before, put it in the fridge, and you've got this time and surface area to just go ham and do whatever you want. And I love that. And um, it was the, at Christmas was, you know, I was just inundated all day with people sending me pictures of their dauphinoise pies oh. that they're making at home for Christmas. And I love that. I love that. I love the individuality and the designs and the style. Yeah. Very well, cool. How do you account for the kind of enduring popularity of pies? Whether it's incredibly you know, elaborate pies like that one, but also just you know, pies at a, at a football match, you know, mm. people, or a Cornish pasty is pie. You know, people love pies. What, what is it about them? Yeah, I mean, it has, um, there's no pretense to a pie, right? When you go to, no, wait, wait, bear with me, bear with me. When you go to a football ground and you get a, a pie a, a pie stall, you know, it's it's hot food, you can carry it, mm. right? Which is why pies kind of came about and stuff, yeah, yeah. right? Um, it, you know, it's full of like meaty goodness, the pastry's tasty. It reminds you of childhood because mum used to do pies on the table if you were lucky. I was very lucky and mum used to do it. Um, <laughs> And it just, yeah, and I think that you can do what I do and mm. sort of go the other way. But we also do pies that are extremely simple yeah. here, which are that yeah, yeah. they are designed to throw you back to sitting around with your family mm. and sort of eating pies as a youngster. I think they're always like, it's always like a gift, isn't it? It is mm. literally like, you know, you unwrap a, the sort of gift of a pie. It's like a present. It's always a delight. It's always yeah. a treat. They are, yeah. The best. Now I can see that we've got loads of questions okay. that have come in. So shall we? Yeah. I'm going to. The wonders of technology I mean that I can read some of these questions here. So um, Callum mentioned about the old pie pastry being inedible. Why was that? And when did that change? And why did it change? Okay. So I think if we look back, I mean, it was quite a long period of time that pastry was inedible. And I think originally it was because the pastry was never there to be eaten. Right? It was there for a couple of different reasons. One of them would be preservation and the other one would be protection. Mm -hmm. right? And I so, guess storage as well. Storage, it's a way yeah. Of storing something. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, pastry dough was there when, you know, the Romans started building roads. And, it, you know, if you go in, it's not like driving on the M25, it's a long journey, right? And the horse and cart. So, the pastry dough would preserve the meat because they would cook the pie empty out the juices and then they would put in uh, a jelly or you know something which would preserve it or presumably. butter yeah, yeah to preserve it yeah. and then the pastry would just be torn away and the inside would so be so it's this kind of portable food isn't it it's yeah your, it is the exactly. I guess the first kind of like convenience, convenience food, yeah right? it is and also I guess uh, you know when people started using coal burning ovens or wood burning ovens quite often the pastry would be there just to protect the meat. Yeah. So again, it would sort of be charred on the outside and it would be thrown away. Mm. And there must have come a point where somebody was like, hold on, we need to eat this pastry. That's probably one of my ancestors. <laughs> and then so, but by the time that Kidder is making mm. pastry in the 1720s and 1730s, 50s. Is that salt pastry at that point? No, that was that Depending he's making. what he was making. Yeah, because he has yeah. different recipes, doesn't mm -hmm. he? Some for puff paste and yeah. some for short crust type. But then there is also salt pastry too. Yeah, yeah. So his you... super elaborate ones are generally yeah. a salt paste. But yeah, his other recipes are edible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, here's a, a nice question. Callum is famous for Welly Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You better tell us what that is. Can you tell us a bit about your Beef Wellington and, and the history of Beef Wellington? Sure. So, uh, Welly Wednesday is, you know, the night, it's the Wednesday night of the week here at the restaurant that we serve our Beef Wellington. And we always wanted to keep it to a special night of the week. Um, but also, it's for like practical reasons, because it takes us about four days to make the Beef Wellington. Seriously? Here. Yeah, because... Uh, can you go through that? Mm, so, <laughs> making the pastry, uh, 
chopping the mushrooms by hand. That's something that I've always done and will always continue to do. And tell us why. I mean, why not just bung you, them in a Roboku? Or yeah, what? I mean, you can. People do. People put them through meat grinders and stuff, but you get different textures of mushroom, mm. right? You don't get a uniform texture. And I think that when you cut it, that's generally when the mushroom falls out. Could I ask you, just, mm. I don't want you to stop, because I want you to carry on telling us about Beef Wellington, but I just want to ask you about your relationship to detail. Mm. Are you quite obsessive slash slightly a weirdo about detail? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm, <laughs> In I'm, the best I'm, possible yeah, way. I've accepted that. <laughs> um, when it comes to food, yeah, I, I really enjoy uh, following technique yeah. and, and being strict about yeah. it and discipline and... And it does make a huge difference. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. If you just throw something into a What it blender, allows yeah. is that allows creativity, mm. right? And it might sound kind of odd, but it does because by being disciplined and, and using mm. technique and things, then we get into the sort of creative art side of things because you have, you know, you've got a base and a structure to do that. Yeah. And that's why I draw, that's why I design things and take time doing it. Um, but the history of Wellington. Wait, wait, we've only, yeah. no, you've only just done the mushrooms. Can you just mm. tell us of the oh, rest yeah, of yeah, it? Yeah. So you just, you've hand chopped all the yeah. mushrooms. Uh, yeah, so uh, we split the work up onto different days. I mean, the, the chopping mushrooms probably <laughs> takes about a day for the whole kitchen. The whole kitchen does it over a day. <laughs> so you hear on that, it's generally a Sunday or a Monday, you're here in the kitchen, it's tack, 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 and everyone is doing it. Amazing. Um, the other thing that does is it, it makes the whole team have a part to play in the production of that Wellington. So when we serve it, everybody's kind of wanting it to be at its best, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, this, doing the spinach sheets that we do, pressing those out, rolling them, drying them, uh, the brassola that we wrap. So we use brassola mm -hmm. to wrap. We don't use pancakes. We did before. Now we use cured beef um, because there is a sort of famous uh, shouty Scottish chef who has always used Palmer ham on his Wellingtons. And I've never understood that. I'm like, why have this dominant smoky ham mm. flavor on a beef Wellington? I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. So we use a really beautifully cured beef fillet instead, sliced and wrapped around. And then obviously then there's the pastry work that goes into it, which in itself is a lot of work. So we, we try and do very detailed lattices Amazing. on there and things like that. And they're huge, right? So one Wellington can feed about 16 to 18 people. And how many will you make for Welly Wednesday? Yeah, I mean, it depends. It's generally around sort of four, something like that. We'll do four or five. Um, and they're so big that we can just cook them in service and we literally just slice them and they stay hot. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And it, I should say there's a brilliant recipe for Beef Wellington in your book, mm. which doesn't quite take four days. No. But no. quite near. <laughs> I know for us. It takes two days. But two you do days. say, yeah. don't try this just when you get home from work and you're trying to get something yeah. ready for the kids because that's not yeah. going to happen. No, it's an amazing recipe. But it, you've got yeah. to surrender to the process yeah, in the best possible sense. That's where people go wrong with Beef Wellingtons is that they try and do it all in a an afternoon and yeah. you can't right you need to split the work up so that's why the recipe is two days it's split the work <laughs> yeah. so the history of beef, beef wellington yeah i mean okay this is sort of contentious point there are different stories yeah. right about it being based on uh an admiral's boot being you know uh to do with wellington himself um i'm not going to lay down my claim to any of those and say that's that's the history of it. I just know that again, like pie making, it's sort of been there through a large part of our history. And it, we, it's one of those dishes we should be super proud of. Yeah, absolutely. And it is what people absolutely love, isn't it? Mm. I mean, people love it. Here's a question, practical pastry question. What is worse, under or over kneading your pastry? Uh, over kneading, over kneading, 100%. Because what happens? Because you create long gluten strands, if we're going to talk about it really yeah, technically, yeah. right? So I was trying to equate this to pasta dough. Mm -hmm. So pasta dough, you want elasticity. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you work it and you knead it and knead it and knead it. And what that does is it creates these long gluten strands, which give it that sort of stretch and elasticity. If we do that with pastry dough for pies, you're never going to have that flaky crust. 
right? Because it will be like chewy. So with pastry dough, what you always want to do is keep it as short as possible. So that means uh, almost underworking it. Uh, and then f like, so for example, if I did uh, a short crust pastry dough, when I mix the butter and flour, just before I kind of bring it together, I want to see tiny little nuggets of butter still. Right. Okay. What that does is, and the incredible benefit that gives is when that's then inside pastry dough and it's cooking, those little nuggets of butter will melt, leave a little air pocket, minute air pocket, and then the water in the dough and the water in the butter will create steam and that will puff that hole. Mm -mm. And that's how you get flakes. In that's pastry. a lightness and flake. And if yeah. you don't do that, it's all compressed and yeah, sort of... Yeah, it's like cakey dough, yeah. right? So um, if, you, if you make a really good short crust by just getting it the right texture, it, it's almost like a puff pastry because mm. it's a lamination, right? Um, yeah, I love it. But, but is there a difference between when you're working the pastry to bring it together? Because mm -hmm. I often get quite nervous about overworking it when I'm, like, for instance, when I'm crimping and I, or, you know, if I'm yeah. handling it too much, it, you know, do you need to be really as little as possible in the handling of pastry after it's come together? Or then can you be a bit more... You can be a bit more, you can work a bit more with it. Because you were yeah. pushing it quite hard, that pastry. Yeah. And, yeah. But because I know that there's that nugget of butter in there, yeah. All that will do, if I squeeze that, that will just flatten it, but it will still be there, a flat layer of butter. butter. So it'll be dough, butter, dough. And that will do that puff pastry effect and sort of puff up. If you're worried about overworking, especially like people worry about heat going into stuff and melting the butter, then I would suggest using gloves. So get yourself some of those sort of vinyl gloves. You know, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if you wear gloves, like, there we go, get some here. Um, I hope this is a glove. Yeah, uh, yeah, like that type of glove. That will stop the heat um, okay. going from your hand onto the pastry. Okay. So that's what we do when it's really hot in the summer. Okay, brilliant. Um, weren't cold pies made for Boxing Day to give the staff a day off? That's a question. I, I don't know, but so that's I, a I, great story. It's a, I, I think that is right, that mm. partly they were made for that, but actually it would depend, of course, on the household. But in sort of larger households, more wealthy households, um, having that sideboard of food, of Christmas right. food, just available, because of course people didn't have central heating, so rooms were colder, so you could have food standing out, meant that there's always food available for visitors dropping in, guests coming, coming around. And so those big Christmas pies mm. would sort of sit on the sideboard th across the Christmas period, available for people to come and, come and eat. Yeah, actually, I want to live back in that era, if we can go back. <laughs> just when there's just yeah. pies just hanging around. Yeah, thank you, whoever asked that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, it's, a really, was... it's, it's really good. Um, why is self-raising flour never seem to caught, catch on in the US? Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know, actually. I don't know why that... It's, and that, yeah, I've always found that really interesting um, because it, it doesn't make sense to me why you would not have those things kind of together, ready to use. But maybe it's just because, uh, I mean, you think about what we use self-raising flour for mm. here. Maybe it's not as sort of prevalent in cooking What's over there. What's a baking culture? Yeah, so yeah. Maybe, but I, I mean, I don't know. But there are some fantastic histories of the sort of, of, of baking powder and, you know, the invention of that and how mm. it's sort of transformed uh, cooking and baking and home cooking and I, I wonder what ha was happening in terms of which companies and manufacturers were yeah. producing things but and also I don't know it's a really good question I don't know the answer to it I don't either. know I'm going to find out no I want to find out too um, uh, do you use anything other than flour in your pastry for example potato we probably have oh, yeah I'm going to say uh, I can't think of a time uh, or an example off my head at the moment, but we, yeah, I mean, we're always trying to use different things, right? And uh, that's how we innovate and, and how we kind of come up with new techniques. So I remember once we were working in Coombshead Farm um, 
down in Cornwall. Mm-hmm. We were, there's this chef's weekend where you go and uh, learn about butchery and things like that. And um, Tom Adams, who owns Coombshead Farm, said to me tonight, cause it was amazing, about 30 chefs, you all cook for each other every night. Oh. We just ate like a big banquet each night after all the work. And uh, he said to me, can you make a meal for you? But I've got this leaf lard from this mangalitsa pig, right? And I made puff pastry using uh, leaf lard from the, ki- the fat around the kidney on the pig. And, and it was like incredible. I mean, it was the, the milfoy tasted of pork, right? <laughs> but the whole weekend was based around pig, but it gave this incredible crispness to the pastry. So I love things like that, like people using potato in dough. Yeah. Trying to understand, new, yeah, it might not work every time, but gives you a foothold into finding something cool. Well, actually, sort of in that thread, what about um, gluten-free pastry for, mm. for like celiacs or, you know, what, what can you do for them and what's the texture of that pastry yeah. and what's it like to work? And So the hardest you... thing with that is finding something that sort of binds the dough, right? Mm. What is the gluten? So uh, we worked really hard over the last lockdown on creating a gluten-free recipe for pastry mm. that matched our other pie doughs. And we came up with one and it was really, I mean, it was just about understanding xanthan gum, right? And xanthan gum for us that acted as the gluten in okay. the dough. And, uh, and we've got a dough now. I'll sort of, I'm quite happy sharing information. I love sort of mm. people having our recipes. I will put it up online soon. Um, that acts exactly like a short crust pastry. Like it's not, you know, it's not uh, that sort of cakey texture mm. you quite often get with gluten-free doughs. Um, I mean, you're not going to get flakes like you would with a normal pie, but um, pretty close to it. And what about in terms of flavour? Does it deliver? It's as, good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, there's great. been so much advances in, in gluten-free flour over the last few yeah. years. Um, you know, lots of, of sort of millers working on that because of the demand for it, um, but. You know, here we try and we do use, you know, for most of our doughs, heritage grains. Yeah. Like, um, you know, that dough there has got rye flour in oh, because that was what Kidder used to use, right? It was rye flour and dough. So we, we sort of mix that in, but we use heritage grains for our, our flour. Um, makes our recipes slightly temperamental. Because depending on the sort of... Because the flour's not standardised, yeah, is, yeah, is exactly. that right? So we ha- I, my chefs need to understand that, that the water absorption rate is going to be different every time. So they have to visually look at a dough when it's making and, and understand if they need to add a touch more water, a touch less. Uh, and what's the advantage to you in using that rather than using a kind of standardised flour? Uh, well, it's flavour and nutrients, yeah. right? So, yeah, I mean, bleaching flour removes both of those really so um yeah i kind of it was always for us going to be the flavor first so actually our pork pie here is super dark in color but that's because we use this you know like unbleached extremely natural flour that's fresh like it's super fresh Mm. it's you know just been milled um but it gives you a dark color on the pastry and i was like well i don't really care like i'd rather it's tasty anyway so yeah (laughs) Okay, I think we've got time for one Mm -hmm. final question, which is um, talking about Cornish pasties, which we were, could you make one with a hot water pastry? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you would get in trouble with the Cornish Pasty Association. I think you maybe you would if you called it a Cornish pasty. Yeah. You might have to call it yeah. something else. But I've done that, and I think it's delicious. I think it works really well as a, as a dough like for really that. really crisp. Yeah, 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 lovely. And actually, when you sort of crimp those edges, I don't know what it is with hot water pastry, but it just sort of concertinas when you bake that. That's... Delicious. Yeah. Okay, that is a fantastic way to end. Callum, thank you so much. My take homes from this, I mean, there are lots, but um, there's a lot more history to explore and, and learn. Mm. Uh, pies are about tradition and innovation and technology. Everybody needs a good rolling pin. A pastry brush is very helpful too. Uh, it's okay to buy ready made pastry, but it's fun making pastry too, so give it a go. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to render down a goose and make fat and make pastry with that, you can. Yeah. But 
that's that's quite hardcore. Callum, thank you thank so you very much. much. Really thank fantastic. You. Thank you, everyone who's been watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this event. Please do look at the British Library's website to see what other events we have coming up. Please remember about our competition as well. Be wonderful if as many people as possible um, uh, tried to win one of those wonderful prizes. Um, you can find out more about British Library events um, on the British Library website. We have a brilliant event next week on food and class with um, Pen Vogler and Ruby Tando. Uh, thank you very much to Callum and to the Holden Dining Rooms for letting us come here to this magical place to film. And thank you so much to KitchenAid for sponsoring the food season. Thank you. <laughs>